So today our subject is going to be motivation. We're going to talk about what motivates you to write, what motivates you to write consistently, and how to keep your motivation as well as just your encouragement and belief in yourself when there's outside voices and distractions going on. But before we get into all of that, I want to chat with you about the book that you have releasing really, really soon. It's your debut sci-fi, right? That's right. Uh, it's called To Sleep in a Sea of Stars. And I've been working on this book for, geez, over seven years at this point. So I'm very, very excited that it's finally coming out. And in fact, there are already advanced reading copies that have been sent out and people are already reading this book, which That's is so exciting, exciting and terrifying at the same <laughs> time. But the book is releasing on September 15th. It's a big old space opera, space adventure. Uh, it's full of spaceships, lasers, aliens, explosions, and of course, tentacles. Make of that of what you will. Uh, and, and, and it was just my love letter to the genre of fantasy. So just as Aragon was my love letter, excuse me, it was my love letter to the genre of science fiction, just as Aragon was my love letter to fantasy. Yes. And she, the protagonist, I, your protagonist is female, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she's discovering aliens. Is that right? Yeah, so the sort of the elevator pitch is that my main character, uh, her name is Kira Navarez. She is a xenobiologist who's part of a survey team on this uh, moon that's being examined in preparation for a colony. And she ends up discovering this alien artifact. And I'm not going to tell you anything more than that. And that okay. sets her off on this giant adventure. And it's... You know, I wanted to capture that sense of wonder that I feel when I when I look up at the stars at night and think about sort of humanity's future and what we might be able to achieve. And I felt that it was very important, uh, although it's a very intense story, to also have a real sense of optimism, both for humans and the rest of the universe. I love it. That sounds amazing. And it's it's a beast. It's a beast of a book. It is a beast of a book. In fact, I can show you. Yes, this is, please do. This is, this is a bit of a... This is the first time I've gotten to show anyone. So give me one second here. I'm going to scroll, uh, push my chair over to the Take bookcase here. And hopefully don't unplug anything here. <laughs> and here oh we go. Oh my goodness. And I don't know if you can tell how thick this is. Yeah. You, you, you wrote a storm light. Well, it's not quite that bad. I mean, <laughs> so, so Sanderson's books are about... Thousand. 400,000 words, you know, 450, depending on the length of the book. This one's only only about 300 and <laughs> 308,000 uh, words. But, you know, for comparison, so for comparison, Dune, which I always think of as being a very long, big book, is about 186,000 words. So this is big. It's big. But, yeah. but, but, uh, and I'm going to tilt the camera a little bit so that I can show this off a little bit better. One of the, <laughs> sorry, one of it's, everything's reversed for me. So You're good. Uh, one of the cool things about this book, in my opinion, is that this is a self-contained story. Uh, it oh, is... really? It's not a series at all. Well, it is and it isn't. It is set in what I'm calling the fractal verse. It's uh, a new setting that I can tell stories in both in the future and the present because it incorporates the real world. Earth exists, so the present day, in the past, all of this is in the fractal verse. And I can tell many, many different stories in this universe. Uh, but this particular book is the first story in the fractal verse, and it does have a definitive end. Because as much as I love huge series like the Stormlight Archive and many others, and I grew up reading those, especially as I've gotten older and I have a little less time to do things outside of work and life, it's nice to have a book that can actually tell a complete story in one Absolutely. volume. And that was the challenge I set for myself to do exactly that. And, and shameless self-promotion here, there are seven maps in this book and there are it doesn't have it it doesn't have it in the arc but there are going to be end papers with art on them and yeah it's going to be it's going to be that is a big gorgeous. seller in fact, artwork in books here is it is <laughs> here it says a, a fractal verse novel love it so, oh it's so exciting yeah i i'm you know, incredibly excited. And I haven't really been able to talk about this in any depth recently. And I don't want to give spoilers away today, but right. to actually hold this, I mean, I just got this yesterday. That's so exciting. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm putting it over on my desk and I'm just looking at the size of 
So yeah, this is the newest book and I'm super excited about it. Can't wait for people to read it and hopefully enjoy it. And I'm actually going to be doing a virtual tour in September for the book, which means that I will be doing virtual events for various bookstores around the country. And all the information is posted on my social media and my website, paulini.net. And if people decide to sign up for those virtual events, here's what you get. The first 100 people to sign up at each of the events gets a signed book from me. And then, of course, oh, during, awesome. and then during the event myself, I'm going to be uh, interacting with some really awesome um, guest hosts. Uh, we haven't announced the names yet. I know the names. They are really, truly awesome people. So uh, if anyone's interested in that, I suggest looking into that. And then, of course, the audio book for, the, for To Sleep in a Sea of Stars is being read, uh, read by none other than Jennifer Hale, <clears throat> who is a uh, Guinness record holder for most prolific voice actress. Uh, and she awesome. has done, she has been the voice of Cinderella for Disney since like 90, 1998. No kidding. Uh, she did the voice of Commander Shepard in the Mass Effect games. Uh, she's done stuff for bio, for, for like, Metal Gear Solid and Baldur's Gate and all this other amazing, amazing stuff, Star Wars. So, but this is her first audiobook, and she's perfect for the character of Kara. So I'm really, really excited that she's reading the book. That's awesome. My husband is exclusively, exclusively an audiobook person. And if the narrator isn't good, he won't, he won't read the book at all. So yeah. that's pretty amazing that you found that you got someone that is that skilled. Well, I I, I feel the same way, you know, a good, good audiobook narrator makes the book or kills the book. So yeah. uh, finding the right voice for that character was difficult, especially because, you know, this is not a young adult book. It is an adult book. And right. uh, I mean, it's not gratuitous or anything, but it needed an adult voice and feel for the story. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to read it. I read all of your Aragon books growing oh. up many, many, many times. <laughs> so I'm really excited to get something new from you. Thank you. Well, I'm very, very excited to have something new finally out. I did have a collection of short stories about a year and a half ago, uh, set in the world of Valgazia in Aragon's world. But this is the first big book I've managed to uh, produce in a little while. So it's it's nice to have it out. Yes, very exciting. I will have pre-order links in the description of this video as well. Awesome. And I, I will say a lot of those pre-order links will let people get signed copies. So they, oh, should, great. Keep, they should keep that in mind also. Yes, definitely. Okay, so on to our topic of discussion, motivation. Yes. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm reading off questions. What I do is I make a community tab and I have people interact with the post. So these are questions from my subscribers that specifically wanna know what you have to say. Um, one of the biggest questions was about motivation for daily writing. How do you motivate yourself to write daily? Is it, is it, is it mostly through motivation and passion or is a lot of it habitual and how do you gain those habits? Yes. <laughs> I mean, motivation is the hardest thing to come by. And I, as I get older, I really started to feel like motivation isn't something you can rely on. I often don't feel motivated and I don't think that's special. I think all of us feel struggle with that at times. You know, the hardest thing about writing is putting your butt in that chair day in and day out and writing, quite honestly, especially if you're really trying to achieve something. You know, if you don't care about the quality of the words, you can sit down and turn out 10,000 words without a second thought. It's the second thought that takes you quite a while. Uh, so more and more I've come to rely on habit and sort of structuring my days to have a system of behavior that leads to success rather than concentrate concentrating on the goal. I mean, it's, it's good to have goals, right? Your goal might be, I want to be a successful author. I want to publish this book. But goals don't get you to where you want to go. They just don't. I mean, like your goal might be to, I want to be a concert pianist. Great. That doesn't get you anything. Right. What, what gets you to being a concert pianist is practicing every day and finding a good teacher. And that's true of so many things in life. And the thing is, is humans are very clever and we have been doing this stuff for a long time. And there are a lot of people in almost every area of life who've already figured out how to do what you're trying to do. You know, mm -hmm. whether that's whether you want to be a, a world class athlete or a musician or a mathematician or a writer. Now, what works for one person isn't going to necessarily work for another person, especially in the creative realm. But there are some certain guidelines and systems of behavior that can help you achieve that. So for me, it's 
the fact that uh, after I have my morning coffee and I've tried to read the entire internet and failed miserably, <laughs> as so many of us do, I, I work. And that's how I view it. It's my work. I don't wait for the motivation. And it is habitual. Uh, also, by outlining my stories extensively and always knowing what it is I need to do next, I don't get stalled out trying to figure out what that next step is. I know my next step. I know my next step for the next three months and usually for the next three years because that's how I'm going to get to my goal. And things change along the way. You know, life throws unexpected stuff at us, whether it's, you know, health problems or financial problems or a car crash or you just don't feel the inspiration, whatever. There's always a challenge or, you know, you've got a newborn kid, right? Right. Uh, so, so your path is going to change and your ultimate outcome may change, but you'll still get something you want to get if you keep sticking with the general habits that are going to lead to that outcome. So that's, that's at least been my experience. So going off of that, you're a full-time author now, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I've been a full-time author since 1998. Okay. So back in the day when you were writing Aragon and you were, you were a student as well as a writer yeah. and time was probably very, very tight for you. Is there, was there a difference in that or was it still just you make time for what you make time for? Well, I had the immense luck to have been homeschooled. Same. My mom... My mom was a trained Montessori, is a trained Montessori teacher. And I said, wait, wait, so you're homeschooled. Uh, Daniel, Daniel yep. homeschooled. I'm homeschooled. Okay. I'm, why am I not surprised? All the uh, greats. All the greats. <laughs> uh, but in any case, because we, we live out in the middle of nowhere. And so growing up, we never really took summer breaks. We would take breaks when it felt appropriate, but we never took weeks and weeks off from school. And a natural result of that is that I graduated from high school early at 15. And that's when I was able to really start devoting energy to writing. Now, if I'd been in public school and I had to do that daily grind, I don't think I could have written Aragon. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible. I know some young authors who've written books while in school, so I don't want to mm -hmm. discourage anyone. But for me, I suck at multitasking. To me, multitasking is not efficient. I'm really good at picking one thing and doing it really fast and as efficiently as I can but ask me to do two things and I do both of them badly. So for example, when I was going through my high school courses, we used an accredited distance learning school called um, American School, which gave me an actual diploma. But when I was going through that school, I would just pick one, one subject and I would just go straight through the textbook. So I did algebra two in like a week and a half, two weeks. I did, you know, Liter my English literature class in about a similar amount of time. That worked great for me. When I was trying to split it up, I felt like I was never making enough progress. I hated trying to compartmentalize everything. Um, so that's sort of a, the, the answer of how I had the time and energy to do, to do it. Yeah. Now, nowadays, of course, you know, I have a life, I have family, I have, um, you know, a lot going on. So time's and actually tighter now time's, that you're full time yeah. than was back as a kid. Yeah. I mean, and so it's the same thing like with Brandon Sanderson or any author who's publishing a lot and has a lot of business stuff going on. Time management becomes one of these essential skills. It doesn't actually mean that you write less. You know, there's this idea that, oh, if I get my perfect writing cave in a, right. in a tower somewhere. And I, you know what? I've actually had times in my life, like with Eldest and Bersinger, where all I needed to do was write. You know, everything was structured around me. So all I had to do was write. And I didn't actually write any faster. And I was actually a little bit more miserable because there was no variety to my life. Interesting. Yeah, I, I saw a lot of comments of how do you find time to write when there's no time to write. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting. I, I assumed your your response to something like that would be you make time, right? Um, but when you had time, when you had more time than ever, it was when you were having the hardest time. I find that interesting. Yeah. You know, I, I remember having this conversation with Tad Williams, who I'm a big fan of his work. And I've met him a couple times. Lovely man. Actually got to visit his house one time. And he and his family have a lot going on, or at least they did when I visited. And I remember asking him between the pets and the children and everything else in life, I said, you know, how do you find time to write and write such large books? And he said, well, you know, when I'm going through the day, I'm always thinking about what I am going to write when I have the chance to sit down and actually write. And so when he does that, then, you know, 
he's able to produce quickly because he knows his time is limited. He's not precious about his work. He produces great prose, but he's done the prep work in his mind. And um, I've, I find that that's actually helpful in sort of what I do these days also. Cool. I'm going to try to pick up the cat here. Yeah, do it. This is Kiara the cat, and she keeps me company in my office. Oh, oh. she's so beautiful. Oh. oh, my goodness. Oh, Kiara. She's probably not going to stay here for more than 10 seconds. Well, though, she's putting, so. it up, putting up with it more than most cats. Well, there are a few typos in uh, the newest book from where she put a paw on the keyboard. So, you know, <laughs> oh, there she goes. <laughs> yeah, they do like keyboards for some reason or just whatever it is you're doing. Yeah. Cats are the best pet for a writer. Now, I love dogs, but cats are better because dogs love attention. And you could pet a dog for one, three hours all day long, and the dog will be happy. And then it wants to go on a walk. But a cat, you know, it wants to be pet. You know, you'll, they'll, they'll put up with being petted for about five minutes tops, and then they'll bite you or yeah. they'll jump off your lap. <laughs> that's perfect for an author. Yes, that's very true. Perfect for me because I like low maintenance in general. And our cat, he's funny and he's sweet and he's snuggly and then he's gone and you forget you even have one. Yeah. And I love it. <laughs> um, okay. This is a question uh, that I was really excited to hear what you said, what you were, how you would reply. As an author, you get tons of input from everyone around you, readers, critiques, editors, publishers. What's the toughest, the toughest critique you've received and how do you use critiques productively and not let it turn into doubt or insecurities? Ooh, I mean, the toughest critique is the critique that you receive from someone you trust. Because if you don't trust the feedback, then you're not going to give it any weight and importance. But if you trust what someone's telling you, then it strikes home. Uh, the, the toughest critique I ever got and I've ever gotten in my life was when I let my sister read the first draft of To Sleep in a Sea of Stars, which had been extraordinarily difficult to actually finish. And she, you know, she's often one of my first, often my first reader, and she has a great story sense. And so I gave her the book, she reads the manuscript, she comes back, and she basically said, um, you know, I know the work you put into this, it just doesn't work. Wow. The book doesn't work. And I actually rewrote the book as a result. Wow. So that was tough, uh, but it was, she was absolutely right. You know, she was absolutely right. And if I had not listened to her, I wouldn't have a book that I'm as happy with as I am now. So to, to answer how you deal with this, writing is this weird profession for a whole lot of reasons. But one of the th weird, weird bits is that you have to be simultaneously, have a, you, you have to simultaneously have an enormous ego so that you can believe that what you have to say is worthwhile, that other people are going to want to hear what you have to say. So right. you sit down thinking, I'm going to write the greatest piece of fiction in English literature. And then when you move into editing, you have to be humble enough to say, this is horrible. It can be fixed. It needs to be fixed. How can I fix it? And it is a very difficult thing to square because the writing process is a lot more fun than the editing process. It's important though, with feedback that you only listen to people who you trust, you know, because some, you know, art is so subjective. One person might be very good with language and, and writing, but they might absolutely hate your subject material. So you're not going to get great feedback from them, or they might hate your genre or, or your prose style or whatever. Uh, so you need to find people who will support you, but who can also help guide you to better achieve the thing it is you're trying to achieve. With all that said, every time I get an edited manuscript, there is a period almost of mourning when that editing shows up. You know, it's, right. it's you know, it might be a couple hours, it might be a day or two where you just kind of take that blow to your ego and go, Ugh. and then you, you know, you pull your pants up and you go, okay, let's make this better. It, it I want to say it gets easier, but it really doesn't. The only way to make it easier is to just keep bettering your craft so that the problems you have to solve are fewer and different. You know, the problems I solve in editing now are not the problems I started with. And that's good because it means I'm changing, I'm growing as an artist. So is there is there a method that you use to combat um, letting that turn into self-doubt and just pulling up your bootstraps and saying, all right, moving forward, we can do this? 
Well, part of it is that I'm in the fortunate position of knowing that my books have been enjoyed by a large number of people. So that right. that provides sort of a safety net for your ego to a degree. Sure, sure. But you also can't let anything go to your head and you can't rely on that. So for me personally, I kind of take the attitude that I'm going to do the best I can. If people enjoy it, that's wonderful. If they don't enjoy that, enjoy it. It's out of my control. And my goals in life are more important to me than whether or not you know, whether or not the reception is what I want, want it to be. I'm not going to let that fear stop me. You know, I have, lar <laughs> this might sound kind of morbid, but I have fears that are greater than that. Than people not <laughs> sure. so, so those greater fears are enough to keep me working. And those greater fears would be things like not getting a chance to tell the stories I want to tell in my lifetime or, you know, not being able to put food on the table. You know, that's a small sure. mo yeah, a motivator, little a little one. Uh, so those, those things and after a while outweigh the other stuff. And then of course, there's a joy to all of this. You know, I love telling the stories. I love the language as difficult as it is. And that provides, uh, that sort of provides a wind at your back that helps get you through the difficult things. Also, because it takes so long to finish a book, you know, even, even if you're working very quickly, it's, it's at least, you know, three to five months to write a first draft. Oftentimes it's a year or so to write a first draft. You need to find daily victories because we depend on those sort of dopamine hits in our brains to just reward us. You can't rely on getting that once a year. It's too far away. You know, you'll lose motivation since we were talking about motivation. So you need to find right. da daily victories. And it might be as simple as saying, I'm going to write 2,000 words today. You get that 2,000 words. You allow yourself to feel like you've done a good job and go relax for the rest of the day. Because then if you write your 2,000 words and say, oh my God, I still have an entire book to write. And then you push for 3,000 words or 4,000 words and then you fail or you burn out. That's not sustainable. So you set your little goal, you set your little victories, your little goals, and that's part of your system of behavior that keeps you moving forward. That's good advice. Very good advice. Um, I have a question that you do not have to answer. <laughs> you said that, uh, that, your new book was the heart was extremely difficult for you to finish. Is there yeah. a reason it was so difficult for you to finish? Yeah. Um, I mean, there were some personal reasons I don't really want to sure. discuss at the yeah. moment. Um, but I think the biggest thing is that I was working on the inheritance cycle for so long. I mean, it was mm -hmm. from 1998 all the way until 2011. And then I was touring for it all the way into the, pretty close to the end of 2012. So, I was working on it from basically the age of 15 all the way up to what, 26, 27, something like that. That's a huge wow. chunk of your life. Yeah, that's now, a huge chunk. The downside of that is because I wasn't actively writing new books outside of that story structure I had already established, I basically got rusty in terms of my storytelling skills. I had to relearn a lot of the things I taught myself in the writing of Aragon of how to structure a story, you know, what works, how to solve these story problems structure problems. And I, I don't want to say I was cocky, but I was overconfident when I finished the inheritance cycle. I was like, Oh, I've just written this series that's been so popular. And, you know, I can write any sort of story I put my mind to, I don't have to put in all the groundwork that I did with the inheritance cycle, I can do it off the top of my head, I can wing it. Ah. And I try and I can't wing it. Um, my brain doesn't work that way. I have to outline I have to work everything out in detail. And then I can do it. Yeah. So that was the difficult part. Um, and also another challenge was working at the technology of the book. I, I wanted very specific things to be possible in the future with my faster than light travel and the other technology. I wanted it to be realistic. I wanted a faster than light system that no one has used in any other sci-fi novel or franchise. And I, this was the big challenge. And I didn't want it to allow for time travel nor did I want it to contradict physics as we know it. And those two elements just made it extremely difficult to get what I wanted, although I did get what I wanted. Yeah, you're happy with the result? Yeah, I actually found some scientists and who were able to help me develop the sort of scientific theory behind this. And I found one man in particular uh, who's actually like a rocket engineer, and he has a theory of everything that provided the basis for this um, faster than light system and some of the other technology in the books. Awesome. That's a, that's one complaint I see a lot with some sci-fi is I see what you were trying to do, but as someone who knows this subject, 
yeah. they missed it big time. So the fact that you actually worked with people who are so knowledgeable in the field has me even more excited, even though I don't know very much. Uh, I know that it, it has me really excited for the feedback that's going to be coming. I mean, I mean, it's still fictional. You know, there is a leap of logic that's involved to yeah. say that this works, even though we know it probably doesn't in the real world, just like with magic. But finding a realistic explanation for that and yeah. And the thing is, is I'm not dumping that on the readers. It's not like every page you're going to getting this technical info dump right. because I personally don't enjoy reading that stuff. Right. But it's it's there. The framework is there. And then in the back material in the book, I have a I actually have a fake scientific paper I wrote all on how the faster than light travel works. And I had so oh, much that's fun. So cool. Read it. Yeah. It's uh, a little difficult to write or read, but uh, for those, I mean, I know there's a certain group of science fiction fans who really enjoy that stuff like I yes. do, and they're going to um, uh, eat that up like candy, I think. Yeah, I definitely And, and then tell right. me everything I got wrong. Right, yeah, which actually transitions great into the next thing. Um, and wait, wait, just kidding. No, it doesn't. <laughs> That's a lie. The next thing, <laughs> the next question that somebody had was um, for both of your series, the one that Aragon as well as this one, which this is not a series, for both of the universes that you've mm. created, uh, did editors and publishers push you to make changes that you weren't comfortable with or that you felt hurt the integrity of your story? And how did you fight for that? No, and, and first of all, look at me. Do I look like the sort of person who'd let someone change my story without my <laughs> consent? No, all, all edits were consensual. Um, there were a couple of things in the inheritance cycle where I went a little off the rails with Aragon and Aria. And okay. I was, I mean, cause I was a teenage boy when I started writing, I had some difficulty putting myself in the mind of a hundred year old elven princess uh, sure. for obvious reasons. And I was very fortunate to have an editor and readers who would sometimes pointed point out when I was getting that a little off. And that was good. That was really good, but there were never any larger story suggestions or edicts that came down from on high saying you need to change X, Y, Z. And nor was that the case with um, To Sleep in a Sea of Stars. Uh, I, you know, I when I rewrote the story and came up with a new structure for the story, you know, there's never been any suggestion of changing that from anyone because and I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but it actually it works. So, you know, you don't need to change things that work. Good. Now, now, as with the new book, there was like one character thing in particular that my sister had a wonderful suggestion. She was like, you know, this isn't working. You might want to consider reworking this and made me grip my teeth at first. But when I thought about it, she was right. And, you know, I changed it. So when that sort of thing happens, difficult as it may be, you, you end up feeling grateful that you had the opportunity to improve your work. I think that's probably a fear for a lot of um, aspiring authors is a fear that they'll lose creative control of their story when they sign it over. No. They, you know, I've talked with a lot of authors over the years and honestly, it's like all these unpublished writers have this fear of losing creative control and like, like they're going to get scammed by the publisher. Sure. You know what? Publishers are in the business of working with writers. If they were scamming authors, screwing them over, they wouldn't stay in business very long. And that goes the same is true for reputable agencies that have been around for a while. You know, their business is working with each other and working with the authors. And if they start treating either of them badly, they won't be in business for very long. So, no, I mean, my experience is that if an editor tells you this isn't working, change it, do X, Y, Z. X, Y, Z may not actually be the solution. You know, you may need to come up with a solution on your own. But nine times out of 10, if they say this isn't working, they're right. That makes sense. I think you probably made a lot of people sigh in relief. I mean, I was <laughs> I was extremely scared about working with a traditional publisher because I my family and I started by self-publishing Aragon. So oh, I, I didn't get, know that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we self-published and I was promoting it while in medieval costume and schools and libraries all across the country. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, in fact, uh, if people Google uh, my name and say plus costume, you'll get an incredibly nerdy picture of me in costume. There's gonna be so many Google searches right now. <laughs> um, so no, we've done the self-publishing thing and I'll tell you, it's, I get the nerd, I get why someone would be concerned about giving up control. Really, the only thing you have to worry about with working with a big publisher is you give them the rights to publish the book, they publish the book, it's not a financial success, 
and they remainder the book, it goes out of print, and you don't necessarily have the rights to it. Now, you can get the rights back. You know, if it's no longer in print, you can get the rights back sometimes. Um, that's really the only concern, you know, whereas if you self-publish, you can keep self-publishing as your whole life, you know, it's never going to go out of print. Uh, it's just a question of economics for a big publisher. You know, if your book's only sure. going to sell 20 copies a year, they may not want to keep it in print. But if you're self-publishing, 20 copies a year might be enough for you. You know, that sure. might be something you're very happy with. Did you have a pretty good experience self-publishing or were you excited to switch over to traditional publishing? We did. Uh, we sold about 10,000 copies of the self-published wow. edition, which is pretty good. Yes. Um, especially this was before eBooks, really. So it was all, right. all hard, co hard copies. But it reached a stage where the book was really starting to get a little popular and we couldn't, I mean, our house was a warehouse at that point. You know, we were just boxing stuff up and shipping it out. And I, was, I wasn't writing because I was having to go into schools. I was doing two to three one hour long presentations every single day. Wow. For months on end at times. And I had a wonderful experience doing that, but it was exhausting and yeah. I didn't have time to write. So by the time... Random House approached us, and we had a competing offer from another publisher at the same time. Uh, we were more than ready to hand the reins over and say, please take care of this and let me just write books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's understandable, especially because marketing and distributing and all that really do become a full-time job when it's all on your shoulders. Yeah. So that's probably a big relief. And just because you get published by a major publisher doesn't mean that you know, you're entirely relieved of the marketing duties because you can still do things to help support your work. You know, and I think a lot of authors do. I mean, our conversation that we're having here today is one way I'm helping support the yeah. publication of this book and I'm having fun talking about all this stuff. Uh, but it's not something that was arranged by the publisher. You know, it was more like, you know, it happened naturally and it's a great thing to do. So there are a lot of things that publishers, excuse me, that authors can do to help bring attention to their books even once it's published traditionally. Actually, I'll go ahead and skip down to that question because that's it, that is a question that several people had. Um, apparently, this is most writers, or at least a lot of writers' least favorite job is promoting and getting their name out there and having to yeah. self-promote. Do you is there is there any way that you have enjoyed this or found the most useful for you? How do you get motivation to switch off of? writer brain and into promotion marketer brain uh practice you know when you first start doing it you're going to get that jolt of fear basically you know you're going to feel i mean what was it i think there was a survey did done that said something like you know the top like after the fear of death the fear of public speaking was the, the the single greatest fear for most most Americans. Right. I, or maybe it was the other way around. If speaking in public might have been a higher fear than even the fear That's of death, heard. right? Yeah. Probably like that. Um, how do you get over that? Practice. You know, when I started doing school presentations, boy, before I went out on stage, you just got like, I, got, I would get this jolt of adrenaline that would just, you know, it's like you're going into battle. That's what it feels like. But people who are watching a presentation want to have a good time they're not there to hate on you right you know it's not like you're a comedian necessarily who's going to get heckled by the audience you know they the, the audience wants to have a good time they're and if they see that you're having a good time then they're really going to loosen up and enjoy themselves as well so i found that by just being myself and projecting and and having fun that i got this energy back from the audience and i started to feel a lot more comfortable and nowadays you know there are people who have been reading my books for so long when i do events it's almost like meeting a bunch of friends that i haven't met before and a lot of times i have met them before so there's this amazing energy coming back from the crowd and it it becomes incredibly uh sustaining now mm -hmm. you're not going to have that experience when you first start, but right. as you as you get it, it gets a lot better. Uh, you know, preparing your remarks beforehand helps uh, it, it, when you're starting out, but as you get more practice, you're not going to need to do that. So, it's it's promotion though needs to be viewed as as, as important as the writing itself right. in many ways. Yes. And people say, oh, that's commercial. You know, that's crass. And it's like, no. You know, you wrote your book because you thought you had something worth saying and you want people to actually read it. Well, this is how you spread the word and get people to actually read your book. You know, there's nothing to feel bad about. There's nothing to feel, you know, you shouldn't feel like you're selling out. This is just a natural part of the process. Mm -hmm. There is a difference between presenting yourself as a personality versus 
um, simply as the writer of the work. You know, there are some authors who really present themselves as an authority, as a personality, as an icon. They consciously cultivate that image. And if that works for you, great. You know, that's it, it can work very, very well, but it's a difficult thing to do. It's almost like a celebrity thing to do. Sure. Um, so long answer to a short question, <laughs> but it is an important one, you know, and I've been to too many conventions where I see first time authors who are just sitting behind a table looking about as miserable as a drowned rat. Like they hate the fact they're there. They hate the fact they're in a crowd. They hate the fact they're in the public and they hate the fact that no one's coming up to talk to them. And sure. they hate it even more when someone does come up to talk to them. And <laughs> And you know, that's just not a good approach. It's not a good approach. I, when I was doing my, my, my early events in bookstores for the self-published edition, I'd have a costume on. I would move the table to right by the front door and I would stand behind the table. I wouldn't sit. I would stand and I would talk to every single person who came through the front door of the store for eight to nine hours straight. And I, wow. wouldn't, even, I wouldn't even go to the restroom. Wow. So that's the sort of energy you can put out there and, and people notice. I still yeah. get people sometimes popping up in my comments saying, I saw Christopher in a, in a Safeway store back in, you know, 2000 or whenever it was 2001. And then he was in costume. I wish I'd bought one of his books. Yeah. Being, being in the reader sphere, as much as I am, I've, I've noticed a definite pattern of people who, are able to see interviews or able to go to a signing and and writers that are just human, writers that are just really chill, nice to talk to people, readers latch on to that. They want to mm -hmm. buy more of their books. They want to follow them more closely. And I've also seen the opposite where readers will say, man, I've heard he's a jerk or I've, yeah. I've seen interviews and he came off as X. I don't, I don't really feel much appeal to keep reading his work or her work anymore. And yeah. having that just human interaction makes people that much more attached to an author's work. Yeah. You know, I also say that I think being homeschooled was a help because I never had the experience of sort of being ridiculed by my peers for any reason. So when it came time to stand up and talk in front of a bunch of people, although it was scary, I never had had the experience of that being like really a bad thing, you know. So that's one thing I think that schools could do a lot better public schools and and adults also you know fostering a safe environment for children and young adults so that they don't get beaten down by their peers and they don't feel like if i go stand up or stand out from the crowd you know i'm making myself a target yes. i mean you know in one theoretical sense yes you do make yourself a target to a degree but the advantages outweigh the disadvantages and knowing how to speak in public is actually a really good skill for an author to have Yes, absolutely. Definitely agree. There were a lot of questions moving to the next one. There were a lot of questions about writer's block. Do you mm. get it? How do you overcome it? How do you avoid it? I don't get writer's block and I don't believe it exists. Please tell me about that. I would <laughs> love to hear you talk about that. I'm being slightly facetious because I, I do know it exists, but I think there are ways to think about it that avoid making it this monolithic block that people seem to get stuck on. So first of all, there are different types. The, the first type is you don't actually want to write. You know, I can't help you with that. If you don't actually want to write, there's, there's no helping that. You know, go do something that's easier. Seriously, there's no point to torturing yourself if you don't actually want to write. Um, but the rest of the types of writer's block, I think, are easier to solve. So for me, the first type is you want to write, but you don't know what to write. So you sit down in front of a blank page, you know, that little line is blinking, the little cursor is blinking in front of you and your mind is blank. You solve that by going and outlining your story before you sit down in front of the page. Uh, you know, think about it like music. I always use this analogy. Writing, you know, it, it's very difficult to perform a piece of music if you haven't composed it. You know, first you compose the piece of music and then you can concentrate on performing it as beautifully as possible. Uh, and if you don't, you just end up with jazz and no one likes that. So, oh, no. <laughs> I kid, I kid. Um, but but it's, it's true. You know, there are writers who can compose while performing, but they're rare. And a lot of times they end up having to do extensive revisions yes. after the fact. So I would say if you want to write, but you don't know what to write, outline your story beforehand. Second type of writer's block or third type, depending where we start counting, is 
You think you know what you want to write, but you don't actually know what to write. So this is where you think you know what you're supposed to be writing and you're, you're typing along, you're typing along and you start feeling this increasing resistance, like things just get difficult. And you keep pushing forward because you're disciplined and you have your habits and you're a determined writer and you're going to get published and you're going to get that new, number one New York Times bestselling book, uh, maybe even a blurb from Christopher Paolini. <laughs> and it just keeps stalling out. And you get to a point where maybe you're producing one page a day or half a page a day. What's happening is your subconscious is rebelling against what you're actually writing. Your subconscious does not feel at ease with what you're making the characters do or the pacing or something in the story isn't sitting right with your mind. So the solution to that is to stop writing before you produce too much material that's not working and go talk through the story with a friend or family member. Or if you don't want to talk it out with someone, take a notebook and literally talk to yourself on the page. Like if you saw my notebooks, they read like the ramblings of a crazy person because I'm talking to myself. I'll as an example, I will write, so this scene with Kira isn't working. I don't know why. What should I do? What if I try this? What if I try this? But humans are storytelling animals. You know, it's the stories are how we structure information. It's how we make sense of the world around us. So if you take your problem scene or your problem book or your problem story and you go and sit down with someone and you tell it to them, you'll find the problem almost immediately because you'll notice when you have trouble telling the story. Interesting. Um, and that's, in my experience, those really tend to be the biggest types of writer's block. There is one other type, uh, and I'm sure there are some other types also, but these are the ones I'm most familiar with. And the other type is, um, you get burnt out, you know, you've been working consistently, you know, maybe you've been writing hard for two, three months and you just burn out. And if that's the case, take a week off or take a day off, what it depending on your deadlines, but you just need a physical break. Sure. Uh, and those, those things almost always solve the problem. And I am a big believer, too, that you should never start writing a book if you can't sit down and tell someone the story and have it make sense and have it be emotionally affecting. Again, I'm not saying you actually need to do this, but you should have the ability to do it because if you don't, you're going to be trying to solve all these storytelling problems as you write, and that's just miserable. Mm -hmm. So you're obviously a plotter, an outliner. I am. There is room for discovery while writing. And I always sure. find things and new things pop up while writing. But the big skeleton, skeleton of the story, the big beats should be established beforehand. And how much time do you usually devote to outlining before you finally put pen to paper? As much as it needs. I mean, I don't know how else to say that. I mean, like for to sleep, I could say when I worked at the new story structure that is what's currently being published, I did that probably in two weeks. And most of that okay. was, in, was within a week, but I was working with an established universe and characters I already knew and all of that. So in, if you're not creating a universe or a world from scratch, I'd say a month is probably sufficient. You know, like if you really burrow down into the characters in the story, a month is really a good chunk of time you spent. And it might seem like a lot of time, you know, you get this cool idea. You really just want to sit down and write it before you lose that burst of creative energy. But guess right. what? An idea is not a story. An idea is a young man finds a dragon egg. Great. That's one event. It's not a story. Yes. So putting in one month of effort for a project that might take you years and if it gets published is something that is going to be talked about for the rest of your life, quite possibly, is a small investment and is really, really worth it. And if you need three months to work out a world and the characters and the story, then, you know, take three months. It's not wasted effort. So for Aragon, you created a new language. For mm. um, for the book that you're about to publish, you bent, sil you bent <laughs> science. So what do you do for world building for those big, complex concepts? How much time do you devote to that? Uh, I mean, a fair bit. It's, it's world building is important. It really is. And what I tend to do is I, my world building is a process of a asking and answering questions. So as an example, what sort of world would a dragon live in? You know, answering that could take me four books, just that one question. Or in the case of the, the science fiction, if a spaceship can travel faster than light, you know, what are the implications of that? And I, I, that's a very broad question. And so you start burrowing down into specifics along the way. And it could be really, really specific stuff that ends up giving your 
book an interesting feel. Uh, you know, and 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 you could spend years on this, so you don't want to lose yourself to the world building and forget to actually write the book because world building could sometimes be more fun than actual writing. <laughs> But it's important, and, and I'm a big believer in this because a lot of times when you read a book and it lacks, it just like never really comes to life or never really feels that interesting or there's never anything anything unique about it. Nine times out of 10, it's because the author just took the first answer they thought of. They never really burrowed down into the implications of like, well, okay, this is a cool concept, but if it actually existed. And I think one reason that people do that is because they are afraid that if they burrow down into that answer, they're going to lose the cool thing that made them want to write the story in the first place. It's like, well, if I really question the reality of this, it no longer makes sense. Maybe. But if you really question the reality of your world building assumption, you might end up in a place that no one else has gone to before. And I've, I've had that experience a couple of times and I find it, I find it fascinating. And I, I love that part of the process. Cool. I love it. Um, okay, going back to what you said about writer's block, mm. one version of writing of writer's block is it's not working. And so you're going back to figure out how to solve that. Mm. When you start to lose faith in your book, when you get to that point where you're realizing something's not working, how do you determine what to push through and believe in and what to let go of and change? So the hardest thing about revisions and rewriting is changing the established thought patterns that you have in your brain. This is the hardest thing to do. And, and, I, and this isn't just for writing, this is anything in life. There's a thing known as the sunk cost fallacy. I don't know if you're familiar with that, yes. but for our audiences, uh, the sunk cost fallacy is that the more time you've put into something, whether that's a relationship or a project or anything in life, the more time you've put in, the more valuable it becomes. And therefore the less likely are you are to give up on something that isn't working. Mm -hmm. And as a creative person, you have to be absolutely ruthless with this. I don't care if you've worked on a book for five years. You know what? It actually doesn't matter. The reader's not going to care. All that matters is if it's working. So if something's not working, you have to be able to go back to your first assumptions, not your second level assumptions, not your third level assumptions, not like not the deck chairs on the Titanic. You have to go back to how was the Titanic built, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. and start thinking there. And it's painful. Like, I don't know what it is about like read the wiring and the brain, the biochemistry, but it almost causes physical pain to do this. Mm -hmm. The closest example I can give is like, it's like if you grew up in a certain religion and you have a crisis of faith and change your religion, or you grew up in a certain political belief and you completely change your political beliefs, you know, it's a fundamental part of who you are and it's difficult to do. Yes. Uh, and rethinking stories is the same way. So how do you figure out what's working? Well, at a certain point, you have to trust yourself. You know, you have to hold on to whatever it is makes that makes you love the story, because uh, guess what? You're not unique. I'm not unique. There's almost, what, 7 billion people on this planet, almost 8 billion, something like that. You know, whatever it is you truly love and care about, there's a whole bunch more other people, probably millions and millions who love that are going to respond to the same thing. Um, you know, we just need to look at the furry community as an example. So, <laughs> um, so that's, that's that, you know, hold true to what you actually respond to in the story. And then you have to just sort of trust your judgment and those of the people you really rely on. And, you know, it's difficult. It's really difficult. You can end up full of self-doubt, but at a certain point you will find your way through the forest. And one thing that can really help is like looking at books on how to write books on story structure. And that can often give you ideas because, you know, you don't always have to reinvent the wheel. You know, if you're writing a heroic epic fantasy, there are certain tropes that have been used a lot. And you might look at those tropes and say, I want to subvert that. I want to use that. I want to I mean, I mean, that's a really interesting idea, but I kind of want to do this sideways take on it. So sometimes things that have already been done could be a very useful tool to get to where you're trying to go. That's good advice. Very good advice. Um, how do you maintain a healthy mindset while you're in the process of writing and publishing? I don't know if I'm the best person to ask about this because okay. I'm kind of obsessive and, you know, the, the, the mental attitude that I take to work it's not necessarily a healthy one, but it's what lets me get the work done. <laughs> sure. So uh, I would say that the things that are going to keep you healthy mentally and through this whole process are exercise. 
you know, you're going to be sitting a lot. So for your health, and I don't just mean your, you know, the rest of your body, I mean, your brain, you have to walk, you have to move. Um, don't take things personally. If someone writes a bad review of your book, guess what? I can find bad reviews for every single Dickens book, every single Jane Austen book, every single Harry Potter book, and certainly for my books. So, <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. You know, what matters is if there are enough people who like your work that you can keep moving forward with your career. And then, uh, you know, try to set up a good work environment, you know, have light coming in, have, have a nice quiet space or have a nice loud space if that's what you like. Just, you know, whatever it is that you need to function as a human being, being, do it. And every writer I know, and I know quite a few, has a different system. Everyone's brain is different. You know, some, some people really like writing in cafes. I can't do that. It totally distracts me. Some people would hate how I write because I'm out in the middle of nowhere. It's quiet. I listen to a little bit of music and I do that day in out, day in, day out for years. And that would drive some people nuts. Um, I know other authors who, you know, don't outline and that drives me nuts. And a lot of authors who do outline. I will say this about outlining. I have known authors who started as non-outlining authors, and over the course of their career, they become increasingly more likely to outline their stories. I've never known anyone to go the other direction. Right. So that is one thing that I've learned being, again, on the reader side of it, being really involved with a lot of readers, being really involved with reading a lot of reviews and getting a lot of other people's feedback on books, is I can read what I consider a masterpiece of a book. I don't have a touch of criticism to give it, and then I'll read reviews of people just tearing it apart. Yeah. And it's not necessarily that they're wrong or I'm wrong. It's not that they're saying things that are untrue about the book. It's something that I've realized is there is no perfect book for every person. And there is no, there is no perfect material. And what works for one person won't work for another. Some people will be a little bit more harsh in the way they want to talk about mm -hmm. their preferences. But... A negative review doesn't mean negativity toward the book. It doesn't mean the book has fallacies, which all books do, but it doesn't mean that the book is, is truly flawed. It just means that readers are individuals and don't always know how to articulate their individual taste in a constructive way. Well, and on top of that, I think it's just an incredibly subjective art, even more so than any sort of visual art. You know, if you see a painting of whatever, a realistic painting. It's very easy to look at it and say, yes, that is a painting of a dragon. I can see the dragon. I can recognize the dragon. It's well painted. That's a painting of a dragon. But when you read a book, language is subjective because, you know, when you see a word on the page, let's say the word for rock, okay, the rock that you just imagined in your head and our audience members all imagined in their heads is different than the one I imagined in my head. You know, maybe one person thinks of something that's more like a pebble or a skipping rock. Someone else is thinking of something that's, you know, larger and chunkier or almost verging on a boulder. There are, there's, there's, so, so when you include a word like that in a description, you just don't know what the reader is going to experience. Sure. And the pacing of language is individual, the length of sentences and paragraphs and all of that. And then on top of that, you get to, uh, you know, the subject material. And that's, that's, that's a big one because everyone has their own history with whatever the subject material is, you know, their own thoughts, their own politics, their own philosophy. So something that seems unobject unobjectionable to one person is horrendous to another person. And both viewpoints are completely valid. And that is a difficult thing, difficult thing to balance. Absolutely. Definitely true. It's, it's a difficult thing to, as well as a content creator, uh, to take in the good and, yeah. and then take the bad and say, okay, I'm going to learn from this. I'm going to deconstruct it, take what I can and let the rest go. That's a really hard thing to do, especially when you're getting constant input. <laughs> and, and some of it is, is I don't like your content. Therefore I attack your character. Yeah. <laughs> and some of it is a little bit more constructive, but it hurts because you know, it's true. Well, and see, that's, that's the, I think the most pernicious thing there where someone doesn't like a book or a movie or content of any kind. So they immediately jump to the fact that they don't like the creator of that content. You know, I have met, and, and you'll notice this if you start like interacting with actors or authors or creatives of any kind, you know, I've met a number of authors whose work I absolutely did not care for. And you know what? I'm pretty sure that they didn't care for my work either. 
and we got along like a house on fire. You know, as soon as we met and started talking, it was like there were more similarities than dissimilarities between, you know, the experience of the profession and the books we liked and all sorts of other stuff. And I'm, I've become extremely cautious about saying that I don't like something now because I, I know these people professionally. I meet them. They're a, right. a lot of times these are my friends. And just because something is not for me doesn't mean it doesn't do what it's trying to do and do it very well. I mean, perfect example is, um, you know, all the criticism that say Twilight got when it was published. Twilight is not for me. I am not the intended audience for it. But Stephanie Meyer succeeded at communicating to her audience incredibly successfully. Now, you know, you, you and again, you could you can have a very honest disagreement with that one way or another year. You can say it's the greatest thing ever written. Um, and I'm not going to pass judgment on that. I will say she communicated effectively. And as a writer, if you want to communicate effectively, you should look at something like that and say, you know, what can I learn from this? And I also think there's a tendency in a lot of different genres also to hate specifically on the things that um, female readers, especially teenage female readers like. So yes, that, that that, is that's very a separate true. thing. Yeah, it is, but you're right. That That's something that gets discussed a lot in the book community that um, books targeted at young women somehow get a lot more, a lot more criticism. Yeah. Well, it's like, you, do you know what the biggest genre is? The best selling genre? Uh, category is YA for sure. No, no, no. Different, different type. Romance. Oh, yes. Yeah. For men, too. A yeah. lot of men read romance. Yeah. And the thing is, is it's often not even listed on the bestseller list because, like, the New York Times bestseller list is, it's best viewed as a list of books that the New York Times thinks, semi-popular books that the New York Times thinks you should read. Because no they, kidding. They so it's have, not actually what's the bestseller. Well, they've split the list into so many subcategories. And they started that because of Harry Potter. You know, when Harry Potter was coming out, it just sat at the top of the list and just sat and sat and sat and sat and sat and never left. And so they split it off into a YA list. And they've continued to do that. Um, and they're not the only ones. Other bestseller lists have done that also. Because, like, if you actually have a bestseller list, a lot of times you'll see romance novels right at the top or business books like Who Moved My Cheese or, you know, The Bible, you know, things like that that are sell a lot, but a lot of times they just get excluded from bestseller lists because that's not what they want to show you. Sure. Uh, I believe the USA Today list, uh, bestseller list, is actually like a complete all-inclusive list that doesn't include anything. Interesting. I have heard that. I've heard that um, romance is the best-selling genre. I worked in audiobooks for a little while, and uh, those were the books that paid the best were yeah. romance because those authors were able to pay better because they were getting far more income. And I've also heard that for ebooks and romance, it's it's largely a male audience because they don't want you to see what you're reading, but they want to read it too. <laughs> well, and, and, and romance is not easy to write. I think people have this you know, sense that it is, but it's not because so much of it is produced. Like if you're not reading it consistently, and this is true for any genre, if you're not reading consistently, if you don't know what's actually been done and you have this attitude like, well, I could go in and write a romance novel, easy peasy. Sure. Like, no, probably not. Probably the idea you think you could write has been written many times. Yes. If you're not familiar with. And probably subject. a couple times by Nora Roberts. Right. Yes. <laughs> Very true. Um, okay. So the uh, last questions that I have for you are all more on the technical side of things. I already asked you a couple of them. Um, how much time for outlining and planning? A couple of people wanted to know about how many drafts you usually write. Uh, as many are, as are needed. Uh, okay. normally, normally, I do my first draft, and I read it through, and I hate every line. So I'll do a second draft, and that may or may not be with my early readers. Um, a lot of times it is. I'll give my first draft to my early readers, and then I'll do a fairly substantial, well, depends on the book, but I'll do a re revision based off the feedback from my early readers. And then once I start working with my publisher, which is usually at that point, um, I'll get a big edit from my editor. That's the first pass edit. Usually a second pass edit after that, which is also, you know, looking at bigger stuff in the book. And then uh, you go into copy editing. And usually there's two or three passes of copy editing. Um, so it's not every book gets that editing attention these days. But 
the sorts of books I write tend to get that attention. So, I mean, I mean, how many rounds was that? I mean, five, six rounds. I mean, at that point, I'm just like so sick of the book that I never want to see it, <laughs> see it again. Basically, I... the rule of thumb is you stop editing when you start changing things back to what they were in an earlier draft. Interesting. I hadn't heard that. I know a lot of people will be encouraged to hear that you hate every word after your first draft because that was a lot of the questions is what happens when you finish writing and you hate yeah. everything you wrote? That's normal. You start rewriting, you start revising. I mean, it gets better. It does get better. Like if I go back and look at chunks of Aragon and, and my early work, I definitely have this feeling like I could have done so much better or I can do so much better now. If I look at my writing now, I mean, there's always room for improvement, but I can actually read a lot of it without cringing too badly, which is encouraging. Is there a point where you finally put the pen down and say, this is as good as I can make it? Or is that something that your editors tell you this is ready? I mean, it's usually, I'm usually to give up, ready to give up before my editors, just because looking at another round of commas is not always fun, but I stick through it to the end. And usually it just ends when the deadlines hit, you know, big books like this, or like the Stormlight Archive or stuff, you're, you just look at it as much as you can in the time available. And that's, that's what you do. And you always run out of time by the end. It's, it's, I mean, it's hard to overstate the amount of mental effort that goes into copy editing something that's almost a thousand pages, mm -hmm. the amount of commas. I mean, the thing is the human brain only has so many good decisions in it per day. So you have to really focus that energy and then you're exhausted for the rest of the day. Um, but you focus <laughs> that energy and you push through and you can only move at a certain speed. I mean, even, even moving fast, uh, you know, if you do, I mean, if you do 50 pages a day, you're looking at what, 20 days to get through a thousand page manuscript. If I'm doing my math correctly, which I'm probably not. So I'm going to divide a thousand divided by 50. Yeah. 20 days. Um, you know, 20 days of nonstop intense work where if you make a mistake, you know, you're going to be criticized for it in the public is exhausting. And then to do multiple rounds of that. Yeah. But it's, <laughs> it, but you know what? It's worth it. It's a lucky, it's a fortunate problem to have. And if you're ever so lucky as to be in that position, you might be gritting your teeth, but you'll also be saying, this is awesome. And I can't wait for people to read this. I have one more question for you. Um, and I just want to know, this is my question. Is there a specific author that or authors that you would say, at least in some small part, you take inspiration from or you model your your personal writing style after? Mm. I mean, too many to list, honestly. I can I can mention a few. Uh, I mean, in terms of productivity, it would be Stephen King. It's like I think everyone wants to write as fast as Stephen King or Brandon Sanderson. So that would be one one goal there. For the latest book, I was massively inspired by Dune, by the Hyperion series by Dan Simmons, um, Octavia Butler, Ursula K. Le Guin, um, Ray Bradbury, you know, a lot of the classics, Heinlein, mm -hmm. a lot of the classics. Uh, in general, I mean, I like a lot of the older stuff, honestly. Uh, and partly that's because what I that's what I grew up with. You know, sure. uh, I read the Gormenghost trilogy by Mervyn Peake, which is the gothiest piece of goth fiction you'll ever read. It's amazing. I love it. Uh, the Worm Ouroboros by E.R. Edison, which is written in faux Jacobian English. It's pre-Tolkien. It's awesome. It's amazing. Difficult to read, but worth it. Um, some really cool female characters in there. Um, you know, the Wizard of Earthsea trilogy by Ursula K. Le Guin, the Mabinogian tetralogy by Evangeline Walton, which again, most people have never read. And it's her writing style is like Tolkien and Stephen King had a love child just without the profanity. <laughs> okay. So um, there, there are a lot. Uh, I'm a big, big fan of Smilla's Sense of Snow by Peter Hogue, which is, it really captures that sense of being an outsider, which I think, um, so few people are able to capture because a lot of them aren't. <laughs> and um, especially growing up homeschooled and everything else, it's something I noticed that he, yeah, he did very well. Edit science fiction, even though it doesn't appear it on the surface. So a lot of books. Um, recently I read, I mean, recently as in the past year or so, uh, I read oh, The Kings of the Wild by oh, yeah. Nicholas, and I don't know how to say his last name. Uh, I really enjoyed that. I haven't read the sequel. And I'm trying to think, what am I reading right now? 
I just read Spider Light by Adrian Tchaikovsky because we have an event coming up um, on the 1st. And my reading pile is just too huge. I, I, th I think I just have the, the, the Poppy War. That's something I'm going to be okay. reading next. So Good deal. I, I love that you're so in love with the classics and uh, several modern books, too, that are really popular that a lot of people will appreciate hearing you talk about as well. So that's great. Well, and I, I don't know if I'm saying her name right. Uh, N.K. Jemison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, ha the I have Broken Earth trilogy. Yes, I, I oh. have from her second series. Um, I forget the name of it. I have her book here that I have been meaning to read forever because she signed it to me at a convention. And oh, so cool! I was finally like, I have to read a book by her, and um, so she signed it. Said something like, you know, it's the author of the other Inheritance series. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that was okay. I haven't read her Inheritance series yet. I just read her Broken Earth trilogy. Yeah. But she's a phenomenal writer. Yeah, no, I've I've heard nothing but good things. So I, it's just the problem is, is when up against these deadlines, writing sure. reading time just slips away. So I, what I tend to do is like have these immense bursts of voracious reading in between projects. Well, I'm really excited to read this book. I, like I said, have read the Aragon series, the Inheritance mm. Cycle. I've read it so many times <laughs> <laughs> that I could years later tell you probably the the like a lot of details of the plot line mm. really really well um it's like it's it's such a big part of my childhood i actually after you emailed me um about coming on i immediately texted one of my childhood friends that i haven't talked to in years and i was like uh remember that series we used to talk about for hours on end i'm gonna hang out with the <laughs> author soon <laughs> it's such a big part of my growing up. So I'm I'm really excited to see how your writing style has changed. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to see how your story storytelling has changed. Well, so so one thing on the story on the style that you can keep an eye on is I deliberately wrote in a much more modern style for To Sleep in the Sea of Stars because I wanted to use a modern vocabulary and I wanted to use a much cleaner prose style versus the more ornate fantasy style. Sure, sure. Um, but yeah, I'd be curious what you think. And you know, one of the cool things for me is because I got published so young in life is that people who read my books like yourself are, you know, have sort of grown up and have their own lives and everything. And I think that's an experience that authors, if they're lucky enough to have that, have much later in life than I'm having. Right. And yeah, it's kind of cool. You know, I go to, um, I go to my events and there are people there who have kids named after the characters. It's oh, like, that's so you cool. know, here's, here's baby Rorin or here's baby <laughs> Aria or baby Safira. And that's like, I'm like, ah, that's amazing. Wow. What an experience. It really is. I'm, I've been very, very fortunate. So I very much hope you enjoyed the new book. And actually, so since I, since I, you know, have this here, um, you want to hear the first line? Yes. Yes, okay. please do. So I'm going to skip all the introductory material. People need to read that. Um, but I see my family and I, we have, we have a tradition where when we get a book from an author that we've never read before, we will do a dramatic reading of the first line to see how we like the first line. So I've never actually read this first line out loud ever. I'm, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm so honored. Uh, let's see if I can even hold this thing. It's so big. So, <laughs> all right. So chapter one, dreams. And here's the first line. The orange gas giant, Zeus, hung low above the horizon, huge and heavy, and glowing with a ruddy half light. I love it. So it's, you know, it's not starting with the weather, but it is starting with <laughs> land, landscape. No, that's good. That's good. Setting the scene right off. I love yes. it. Yes. Oh, I'm so excited. I can't wait to read more. <laughs> well, again, I wanted to say I've, I've enjoyed some of your videos. Uh, YouTube started popping them up toward me because I watch a lot of fantasy stuff on YouTube. And uh, I'm really happy that we were able to have this conversation. And if you enjoy to sleep and would like to discuss it after it's published, that's certainly something we could do. Absolutely. I would love that. Thank you very much. And thank you again for coming on my channel. I have had such a great time chatting with you. My pleasure. All right. Well, thank you everybody that watched this. Be sure to continue chatting about it in the comments. Be sure to check out um, Christopher Polini's website. It'll be linked as well as the pre-orders are all in the description. I post videos every Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. I'll see you guys again soon. Bye.